The aviation industry is considered one of the toughest to decarbonize, but in the past year, we've seen some innovation around low carbon fuels. So I'm gonna interview Val Miftikoff, who's the CEO of uh, Zero Avia, uh, which recently announced a memorandum of understanding with de Havilland Canada to develop hydrogen electric engines for the Dash 8400 aircraft. So welcome to the interview, Val. Thank you, Margaret. Appreciate it. Um, and yes, we're very excited about uh, what we're doing, uh, definitely. And uh, this latest deal with uh, de Havilland is uh, uh, really pivotal for the company. Um, so yeah, excited to talk about it. Well, look, I I'm very, very interested in hydrogen uh, engines for aircrafts because I think uh, the, the limiting factor here, as I understand it, has been uh, carrying hydrogen as a fuel on the aircraft. Uh, have I got that right? Or uh, are there innovations, recent innovations that solve that problem? Yeah, well, it, it, let's uh, zoom back a little bit, right? So everybody's talking about um, decarbonization of aviation. It is a really hard sector to, uh, to do it with, um, uh, mostly because of the uh, extreme power and energy demands of aircraft. You have to not only propel something uh, a distance, you also have to lift it in the air and you have to support it in the air. So all that takes a lot of energy. Um, so not a lot of substances or energy storage types actually are applicable for that. So a lot of people tried initially with batteries uh, and now uh, more and more people realize that the batteries are not gonna uh, uh, let uh, people carry large aircraft for long distances. So really hard to make it work. Um, sustainable aviation fuels, a lot of people talk about those. Uh, synthetic fuels, um, just drop in replacements. Unfortunately, it's a, a much less efficient way to do it and more expensive way to do it compared to what we are doing, which is hydrogen on board the aircraft, fuel cells uh, convert to electricity and electricity running the motors. The challenges in that approach um, are still remaining, and that's what our company is solving. And largely, there are two challenges. One is uh, what's called specific power of the uh, power plant itself, or most um, notably fuel cell system, or even more uh, specifically fuel cell balance of plants. That's everything that makes fuel cell work. Uh, and specific power is how many kilowatts um, of power you can get out of one kilogram of that fuel cell system. So that needs to be pushed significantly. And we're well on track uh, to do that. And the second challenge is, as you mentioned, um, carrying the fuel. But the, the carrying the fuel problem is not so much uh, a weight problem, but a volume problem. Uh, hydrogen takes more volume per unit of energy produced uh, than um, uh, kerosene. On mass, it's actually much better. On mass, it's three times better than kerosene, than jet fuel. Um, so you can actually see aircraft, uh, assuming you have enough volume for fuel storage, you can see hydrogen aircraft going longer distances even than the jet fuel aircraft because of that mass advantage. And so that's why, by the way, you know, of course, we start with smaller aircraft and you know, sub-regional uh, uh, commuters, um, uh, sort of 20-seat aircraft, uh, and then um, we're hoping to go to larger and larger. Well, let's talk a little bit about the specifics, Val. Uh, so uh, what's the drivetrain here? So you've got a, you've got hydrogen, you've got a fuel cell, you've got an electric motor that drives, drives the propellers, or is it a, a jet engine, how, uh, like a turbine? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, exactly. You got it. Uh, you got it right. Uh, basically, so hydrogen uh, stored in the aircraft in pure form in hydrogen tanks, and uh, for smaller aircraft, it's gaseous hydrogen. For larger aircraft, like a De Havilland uh, Q400, it's a cryogenic liquid uh, form. And then hydrogen from those tanks goes to the fuel cell system. The fuel cell system takes that hydrogen from tanks, takes oxygen from the air through a compressor. Uh, and converts that in a low temperature, low pressure, electrochemical catalytic reaction to electricity. Very high efficiency relative to the turbine engine. So that's one of the advantages of, the, uh, of this powertrain. And then that electricity goes to the motor and power electronics uh, that converts it to rotation of the shaft. And then that shaft can rotate any propulsor, right? So initially it's a propeller, for smaller aircraft, but eventually it's an enclosed fan, uh, just like what you see in the jet uh, aircraft, larger jet aircraft. 
Now, I understand that you uh, signed a an MOU with another company uh, to do some work on to, to produce a demonstration aircraft. How far along are you in the technology and and you know getting to a, a demonstration or pilot project? Yeah, so uh, uh, we we have signed several MOUs with uh, with a number of folks, and most exciting ones are of course uh, the likes of uh, De Havilland and. Um, you know, United and uh, Alaska Airlines um, uh, that are actually looking to uh, to operate this aircraft. Uh, so we're really fortunate uh, that we have that support. Um, we're getting pretty close. Um, we have flown already some prototypes, smaller prototypes. Um, we're about to fly a uh, larger 20 seat vehicle uh, just in, in, in weeks. Um, in fact, uh, later today, we'll be uh, releasing a uh, first uh, fully integrated test video of a 20 seater. Uh, aircraft, so uh, uh, stay tuned on that in the next hour or so. Um, and um, we are looking to uh, have ground demonstrations of a large engine that would go into the likes of uh, Q400s and, and some other large turboprops um, next year. And then hopefully uh, the test flights uh, of that uh, aircraft, of that size aircraft um, in 2023. Now, I understand aviation regulators are, you know, understandably uh, pretty tough. Uh, so uh, you're working with the, the various uh, regulators in different countries. What are some of the issues that you're having to deal with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, we've been working with the uh, FAA and the CAA, Civil Aviation Authority in the UK, uh, for the last more than two years, uh, really. And of course, the, the work is uh, intensifying and um, we, we had real um, uh, sort of connection points with those um, uh, regulators as we flown the aircraft in both US and the UK. And you have to get the permission. You have to explain how your technology works. You have to show that you've done your homework on the safety side. And that helps us tremendously um, in pushing this uh, also to a certified um, uh, condition because the, the regulators are already familiar. Um, some of the challenges there, of course, uh, you know, especially on the hydrogen side, on the fuel cell side, this is new technology. It has never been used as primary propulsion for aircraft. Um, so new uh, certification basis and new means of compliance need to be defined. And that's what we're working with um, CAA and FAA on. Uh, there are uh, plenty of people uh, engaged from both organizations and, and ourselves. Um, we have our own uh, certification office and design authority um, uh, office that we're building up. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, this is a very uh, active area of work. Now, Val, uh, if you could uh, get your crystal ball out for just a moment and uh, talk about, uh, you know, considering the technology, you know, getting it perfected uh, so that you're ready for commercial flights and then getting all of the regulatory approvals and so on. If you were to take a guess, or maybe you have a schedule already, uh, when do you expect that you might actually be able to have these uh, propulsion systems in planes ready for commercial use? Uh, let me get the crystal ball out of here. Uh, well, actually, we do have a we do have a plan, and um, for the smaller aircraft, for the twenty seater um, and the likes, um, the target uh, is twenty twenty four, so three years out. Hopefully, great uh, Christmas present uh, for uh, twenty twenty four. Um, in commercial uh, service. Um, and uh, for a larger aircraft, uh, uh, like uh, some of these Dash 8 uh, aircraft by DeHamelin, uh, 2026, uh, 27, so five years out. And uh, that means that um, uh, probably, you know, two years before those times, uh, we would have the lockdown designs, uh, co um, uh, compliance articles that we would then push uh, to the certification. But Long before that, as we are doing now, we're engaging with the regulators uh, to um, uh, validate the designs, get the feedback, and uh, turn the feedback into uh, the actual design decisions. But uh, yeah, three and five years out. Well, that, that's terrific. Uh, well, final question, Val. Uh, are there any uh, significant obstacles to scaling up your technology once it's been proved out and ready to go commercial? Uh, anything around you know, availability of critical minerals, uh, anything like that? Yeah, not so much on the mineral side, um, but there are some engineering, significant engineering challenges. Um, and uh, we talked a little bit about it, but I can go into a little bit more detail. So on the, uh, on the mass of the fuel cell system, uh, there is a lot of uh, work that we're doing on the thermal management 
uh, how to get the heat out uh, of the system without inducing um, uh, a lot of mass uh, or a lot of cooling drag, what it's called, right? So you can you can imagine um, you know, classic um, solution in the automotive world is to put a big radiator. If you look at those uh, fuel cell cars uh, out there, like Toyota Mirai and such, uh, they have huge radiator, huge grills up front, right? Because um, you need to get the heat out of the fuel cell and the heat is relatively what's called low grade, low temperature. So you need more surface. Now you stick that huge thing in the aircraft and you induce a lot of drag, right? So that's a big challenge because then you're gonna burn a lot more power to just push that through the air. So how to do that uh, more efficiently is a big area of focus. We have uh, a number of patents on it uh, or patent applications on it, some IP. We're trying a few things and we need to push that uh, quite a bit. And then on the fuel side, um, a lot about uh, uh, the finding the volume for fuel in such a way that um, uh, will not trigger the full recertification of the airframe. Uh, because a lot of these airframes that uh, are flying today uh, in regional areas, um, uh, regional flights, uh, they have been certified a relatively long time ago. And if you push them through the certification now, uh, let's say you make a very significant change to the airframe, FAA says, well, it's a new airframe now, so you have to certify it all anew. Uh, a lot of the subsystem will not pass. Right. So we need to figure out how to do that um, modification so that it's uh, it can be certified as an add on versus the completely new airframe. Well, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Good luck with all of this. It sounds very exciting. I appreciate that. Uh, great to be here and uh, exciting news uh, all around for the whole industry. So uh, happy to be uh, pushing the uh, pushing things along.